Um, yeah. In fact, earlier today, my um, assistant was like, she called a kibosh on me agreeing to speak at things for free. She's like, we have three monthly events we need to sell tickets to. Could you stop doing this? So she also asked me why I did this. But you know what? I... We do three, the answer is we do three monthly events. And like, I think it's good event karma when someone reaches out to you in a very personal way and says, you know, I'd really like for you to come. And, you know, it's like, wow, that's, a, you know, you want me to come? How hard is it? And hopefully if I do, then people speak at my events and come. And it's, it's all karma is why I said yes. But unfortunately, I can't drink pizza. I'm on a um, juice cleanse because I'm trying to lose all my baby weight. So I'm just looking at the pizza and cookies. Um... So I was never one of those people who just was dying to start a company. I never felt like I had to be an entrepreneur. I was more than happy to spend my life in Silicon Valley writing about entrepreneurs and also traveling the world to write about entrepreneurs. My, my second book that I did, I went on a 40-week journey around the world. And my husband and I bootstrapped most of that book. So I, I typically did a lot of very entrepreneurial things, but I had a lot of reverence for entrepreneurs. And I, and I felt like there's a difference between you know, being a cliff jumper and jumping off your own financial cliff and taking a whole bunch of people with you and a whole bunch of money with you. And I never really had the desire to do the latter. Um, even though a lot of people tried to convince me to. Um, the reason I did, there were two reasons. Um, the more sort of immediate one was um, the job I was supposed to be doing um, got stolen from me while I was giving birth. So I found myself coming out of giving birth. I was supposed to come back in January and be the editor of TechCrunch. And while the company was exploding, um, someone cut a side deal um, in order to stabilize the company and stole the job from me. Um, so, you know, that, that obviously left me with a choice at a really pivotal, pivotal moment. And I, um, we, were, we had been working on this um, conference in China that I'd been working on for two years and was a huge passion project of mine. And I'd really made a commitment to the entrepreneurs I'd met there over seven different trips that I was gonna bring Disrupt there. And I'd been working on it for two years and um, you know, even giving birth didn't derail me from it. I, wanted to, I wound up going six weeks after giving birth, which was crazier than I thought it would be, crazier in practice than I thought it was in theory. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna put off any decision about my future until I go do Disrupt. I don't want it to be distracting. I don't want there to be any drama. And when, but over the time, I was obviously thinking about what I was going to do. And it just became clear that there was no place for me still at the company. So that was one of the biggest reasons that I did it. The other was, every time I was between books or between jobs or between projects, I always looked around. And there were fewer and fewer places where I could work and do the kind of work that I wanted to do. Um, there were very few places where I could make a good salary as a really experienced, tapped-in reporter. There were really few places where I could do high-quality work, where I could do long-form work, investigative journalism, breaking news, um, where I could have the nimbleness of new media, but the quality of old media. And when I decided I couldn't go back to TechCrunch, there was absolutely nowhere that I could work. And so I decided I had to build it. So the two biggest reasons were, my job was taken while I was given birth, and I just looked around and thought, if as one of the more experienced people who's covered Silicon Valley for more than a decade, you know, I can't find a job, there just are no great jobs for writers in Silicon Valley right now, and so I wanted to create them. Um, so, uh, there were, and some of the other things that I wanted to fix, I really had um, grown to hate that um, blogging had really become about rewriting press releases really quickly. Everyone got in this fight to get on the highest they could on the tech meme leaderboard. And there's only one way to do that, which is rewrite a press release really quickly. And have a very bland headline, and have a logo of the company, and then basically be a faster press release. And I think this was most pronounced to me when Facebook was filing its S1, where you had a whole industry of really, really smart reporters who are literally, and this is an old and new media, I mean, I think this infected old media as well, who just sat there clicking refresh on the SEC website for hours, for hours. And then when it popped up, raced to cut and paste a publicly traded document into WordPress and hit publish. Like, what the fuck? That is so in no way, like even at least rewriting a press release adds some value, but like cutting and pasting a publicly available document 
two seconds quicker than your competitor so you can go up a notch on this bizarre leaderboard that wasn't even created by a journalist. Like, maybe it's just me and maybe we'll fail, but I just thought that was an abomination. And I think it's actually insulting to the reader's intelligence, and I think it's insulting to the intelligence of all of the reporters. This is not the reporter's fault. There's a lot of smart reporters at these places. It's the system we've gotten trapped in. And this idea that just because we can see all of these metrics of who's reading what story when and how many tweets it has, that that should be the arbiter of quality. And so when I interview people um, for our events, we always ask five questions, and one of them is, what's the thing you believe that no one else does? And mine is that I don't judge the quality of a story by metrics. And I think I'm the only editor in, the ch in chief in the world that doesn't do that right now. I don't believe that that's how Catherine Graham grew the Washington Post. I don't believe that's how Henry Luce grew time. I, I just don't think that's what you do. I judge quality. We've turned off the metrics so that the staff can't even see them. And I tell them if it's a good story. That's how we judge if it's a good story, not by how many people click on it. So it's a really bold and different way to, to build a blog. Um, you know, some of the other things that I believed is that um, reporters really should be the rock stars of companies, and I mean reporters plural. I think we fell into a system where there was always one big rock star at a lot of these blogs, and then a lot of people just sort of being varying levels of assistance to them, and I think that's why a lot of these blogs haven't gotten bigger, and I think that's why when they've been sold, they haven't been sustainable companies. Um, you know, my goal was to build a property that I could work at the rest of my career. And if I was going to do that, I knew I needed a really, really good team because one person cannot carry a blog for that long. You'll burn out. It's just impossible. So in order to do that, I want to attract really, really great reporters. And you do that in a couple ways. One thing is you pay them really good salaries. I think that reporters deserve good salaries. And I'm not talking about even six figures or hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I'm certainly not talking about 25, 30 grand, which is what a lot of blogs were paying um, in the first version of blogs. Um, I think they deserve benefits. I think they deserve health care. I think they deserve a new computer if they need one. I mean, I literally feel like Oprah every day in my company because people will say, people will call me and be like, um, long preamble of like why they can't do their job because they're six-year-old computers. And I'm like, just go to the Apple store and get another one. And they're just like, really? And it's like, yes, you need this to do your job. Just treating reporters with dignity on, uh, by giving them the tools they need is, is, is amazingly disruptive. I think the other side of that is freeing them up to do really great work. I mean, we require that our reporters do one to two stories a day, not six to 10. And everyone on staff does an hour of um, what we call Pando ticker duty, which I don't know if you've seen the site, but it's on the left hand of the site. We do about 60 stories a day. We basically, that's our way to give you all the basic information that you would be getting if we were rewriting press releases without having to click through a lot and having it to be really scannable. So we think of it as stuff you can find elsewhere on the web. We're just giving it to you in a much easier to consume way. And then that sort of sucks all of that out. So the rest of the blog is like stuff you're not reading anywhere else. So everyone reverently does this hour of ticker duty a day because they know it frees them up to do one to two stories a day, which is this amazing luxury. Way more volume than I did when I was a staff writer at Business Week, but in this day and age, amazing luxury. And not surprisingly, I, you know, even our entry-level reporters who are 19 years old are breaking huge stories, have made huge strides in their writing, are writing really complex, amazing, amazing work because we're just giving them the space to do really, really great work. Um, we believe in having editing. One of my first hires was a copy editor. Um, I think we're the only tech blog that has an on-staff illustrator. We believe in art, that it shouldn't be an afterthought of a blog post. I mean, in, in, in total, I want to bring back, I love so much of new media, but I think all these things were thrown away with old media that shouldn't have been thrown away. And I think the result of what we have now you know, six, seven years in, however you date it into the tech blogosphere, is a lot of that stuff being thrown away. So in order to do that, um, I needed to raise money, and I definitely did not have the sort of blog approach of let's just slap Google ads on the site and do a federated media deal, and we'll sort of limp along. I said, you know, I'm building something I'm going to run the rest of my career. I'm building something that has a really long-term vision. We're going to really go for this. I want to pay people really big salaries. So I went out and raised two and a half million dollars. And I have to say, in terms of struggles, the fundraising was actually the easiest part. 
because I was lucky that what I was, I was building something for a market where the people with the money thought there was a huge hole in the market and desperately wanted that thing to exist. So I was sort of essentially selling exactly to the people who thought there needed to be a new, really well done, new voice in tech journalism. So raising money was actually surprisingly easy. Um, hiring people was incredibly hard. You can tell people, you can give them this, every reporter I've ever talked to about hiring always says that like the vision that I've painted of what they can do sounds idyllic, but it's like too idyllic for people to believe. And one thing that I noticed is even if people will tell you they're sick of sitting in a room and rewriting press releases all day long, it's really scary to stop because you know you can wake up every day and find six press releases to rewrite. You, you don't know, I don't know. I'm 15 years into this and I still don't know what I'm gonna write tomorrow. I don't know what I'm gonna wake up and find. I don't know that I can find one to two really amazing stories that I have something to add to that no one knows. Mark Andreessen told me years ago when I was reporting on my first book where he said that the thing that stunned him the most about his career was when he first met with, um, with Jim Clark and Jim Clark asked him to do Netscape with him. And you know, he was this kid who had just come out you know, from college and you know, was living alone and had a job coding and like, you know, just didn't really have anything to lose. And so he was like, okay. And he found out later that he was like the fifth or sixth kid that Jim Clark had asked. And Jim Clark was like the man then. I mean, there was no one bigger than Jim Clark. Still the only person who's had three exits of a billion dollars or more as a co-founder. And, and Mark was like, I can't believe no one accepted this before me. And he said, you know, I learned then that most people think they're risk takers, but even when you hand them on a silver platter an amazing situation, which is everything that they say they want, most people will think about it and flirt with it, but most of them won't take it. And that was the biggest surprise to me in terms of hiring. Um, so I, I found that almost everyone who, I, who didn't accept immediately, it didn't work out for one reason or another. Either I revoked the offer because I just felt like it wasn't the right fit, or they didn't wind up accepting it, or they just wasted a lot of my time. So I started doing a 24-hour rule where some, once I made an offer, someone had 24 hours to respond. And it's been one of the best things I've done because I have such limited time and I don't have time for people to endlessly window shop. And it means everyone in the company has such conviction that as soon as they heard about the company, they were jumping at the chance to be there. Um, I, I got another really good piece of advice when I was sort of carving that out of, um, you know, you don't want people in your company that you've had to sell too hard. You know, you want people who just get, because you don't want to have to keep selling them every day. Um, I don't want to really get into the details of this, but anyone who's followed our companies knows that um, it would not be a surprise. Pick your board members carefully would be a tip of mine. Um, and when dealing with any issues from that, I think, you know, one thing I love about Silicon Valley is no one tries to pretend these things aren't emotional. We're all super emotional about our companies. I mean, you don't deserve to win if you're not hugely emotional about what you're building. No one should come work for you. No one should invest in you. This should be emotional. So when things blow up, they're super emotional and I don't think you can pretend you're, that they're not. And so I'm a big fan of like embrace, embracing the emotion and sort of letting it out and owning up to how emotional you are, but then you know, really acting rationally and what's the best thing for the business. But I think when you try to really suppress it and try to pretend like you're not reacting out of emotion, then you're not able to make the rational decision. Um, another good piece of advice I got from one investor was to sleep. <laughs> I think there's always this macho founder thing of you shouldn't have to sleep, you should work 24 hours a day, you should work every weekend. And like, if you're trying to build something to flip, that's great advice. If you're trying to build a company for the long term, like it just won't happen, you'll burn out. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I wanted to say that was a surprise that it wasn't more of a struggle was um, building a company and having a newborn baby. Um, definitely, I would have never planned it that way. Um, and I would have thought, based on everything I had heard from, you know, 15 years of talking to entrepreneurs that like, and, and you know, many more years of knowing people who've had children, that that was absolutely just unworkable. But, you know, it actually has been pretty workable. And in some ways, it's actually been an advantage for me. I think, um, you know, if I had had any job in journalism, I'd be working 70, 80, 70 to 80 hours a week. I think most of us in the Valley work that, whether we're starting a company or not. Um, this just isn't a nine to five culture. 
And I think if, you're gonna, if I'm going to be spending that much time away from my baby, I sure as hell didn't want to do it rebuilding and correcting mistakes for a declining blog for AOL. I wanted to be doing it to build something really amazing and really new that I really believed was super important in the world. And I wanted to do it creating really great jobs for really great writers who didn't have anywhere to go. So to me, it's, it's a lot easier actually to be away from my baby when I have to work because I feel like I'm building something really, really important. I don't feel like I'm doing a job. And so it's rare that I have five minutes where I'm not with the baby or working on the company, but you know, I can't imagine two better ways to be spending my time. And I think having to take two hours a night to hang out with a baby actually gives you really good perspective. I think sometimes that, you know, it's the whole working within constraints thing that, you know, we know over and over again in startups. And I think it's sort of been that own example in my own life. So I think people are always really scared off and think that, oh, if I'm over, you know, 20 and I have a life, there's no way I can do this. And, you know, again, I think if you're building something long term, you can. Yes.